on the afternoon of April 16, 2022, three young people from My Dog Media entered the historic Palace Theater in Lorain, Ohio to screen a classic tale. A chainsaw-wielding maniac Leatherface up to his cannibalistic ways again. The mass killer has set his sight on the hero of our story, DJ Stretch, played by Caroline Williams, and she is here tonight, signing autographs, taking pictures, a special Q&A with tonight's host, the Big Bad B Movie Show. From Sal Rizzato, a Wurlitzer organ performance of the soundtrack, Fenders, Food Trucks, music provided by DJ Kung Fu Bob and DJ Deadlift. Officially on the records, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre never happened, but over and over again, reports of bizarre, grisly chainsaw mass murders have persisted all across the state of Texas. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre has not stopped. It haunts Texas. It seems to have no end. I'm here in Lorain, Ohio for an event being put on by my friends over at My Dog Media about a favorite film of mine, the 1986 Texas Chainsaw Massacre, part two, starring Bill Mosley as Chop Top, Bill Johnson as Leatherface, Dennis Hopper as Lefty, the Texas Marshal, and it's directed by Toby Hooper. The special effects were done by legendary Tom Savini, but for me, the one who steals the show is Miss Caroline Williams. And she's here tonight in Lorraine, Ohio, here at the legendary Lorraine Palace for a screening of the movie, a Q&A, and she's gonna sign her autographs and take pictures. And the movie soundtrack is gonna be performed in the Lorraine Palace Wurlitzer organ, which I think is about to start right now, so let's go check it out. All right, everybody, get ready to give a big welcome to Soul Rosado on the organ. He's going to be playing here very shortly. Please be sure to welcome them. They're extremely talented to play the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 theme. Woo! Oh, that is so cool. Look how the organ's raising up out of the stage. Now you didn't have any sheet music either, right? You, yeah. had to, you learned it all by ear? Yeah, there's no sheet music that's, that's available, so a lot of it is just processing stuff by ear and seeing uh, you know, what you can do with it and the freedom that you have in the school. So, you definitely nailed it. Yeah, so it's an amazing, amazing opportunity, great sport, great place, great people, so. Good job. Thank you.
bags for the show. Oh, that was awesome. So, yeah, on my You're definitely very talented. You're welcome. Do you custom make all these? Yes, I do. Yep. Yep. These are amazing. Thank you. Here's the a port, uh, well, it, it, it'll take you to my catalog. All right. And if you want anything custom made, you can get a hold of me and we can make custom stuff. All right, that's amazing. That's really good work. Thank you. Yep. We got Pinhead, Creature of the Black Lagoon. I love the leather paper. Here you have some advertisements for the Haunted Garage Sale, yes. which, which was a huge hit last year, yeah, I should mention. Yes. <laughs> yes. This year it'll be our seventh annual Haunted Garage Sale. Wow. We're moving it to Weissfield and Avon Lake. We outgrew Kaloon Park in Bay Village. And uh, we're going to have some amazing vendors right now. We're going to have over 80 vendors. We're going to have at least four food trucks. We're going to have one amazing... Uh, piece that uh, it's we're going to be laying that out there for everybody last year we had the green goblin head from, yes. from uh, maximum overdrive and we're still locking in the big uh, you know one for this year so that's to come yeah that'll be exciting but it's free to attend it's going to be on july 30th that's a saturday at rice field it's from 10 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon and it's free to get in great but it is such a beloved film because of its originality, because of how different it is, and how did you learn about the casting call for Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2? It popped up in the local newspaper. It was just an ad in the paper? It wasn't even an ad, it was like a gossip column item. Oh, so it was a blurb. Like a <laughs> blurb. Like, Toby Hooper, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and in parentheses, it's got like an exclamation point. And uh, is coming to Houston to do some, he's coming to Texas to do some, some casting on his sequel, 13 years later, he'll be shooting in the Austin area. And, you know, I had a little agent at the time who called him up and said, I'd really love to read for this. And I got to go audition. What I noticed about your character, Stretch, yeah. You play her with such a, a steadfast strength and earnestness. It, she is so likable. You're rooting for her for, from the first scene. And honestly, for me, men, stay with me here. When I watch part two, to me, it seems like a, a, it is like a woman's movie. You are the movie. 
you, you, uh, the, the scene when you first run into Chop Top, and it's about finding yourself in these uncomfortable scenarios that you have to, you have to play to the man who's in front of you while getting out of a very sticky situation. And I think every female has absolutely been in that situation. I mean, not obviously with Chop Top. Um, <laughs> Men who feel like that, and there are so there's a lot of points of reference that I, I it always resonates with me every time I, I watch it, even when the first time I saw it in high school, that it just felt like I had been her before. And I think that's why women embraced her so much as a character because she was motivated, obviously, to take the initiative in her own defense and to try to turn the tables on this crazy family because they're crazy. And, you know, she's trapped in their underground lair. She's underground. You know, Chop Top, when we shot that scene, I had not seen Bill in his makeup yet. I, he was doing four-hour makeups every morning, and then at least a couple of hours in, when we would wrap to get the makeup off. So I never really saw Bill until he came to set. And just everything about it, there's a visceral body reaction to somebody who looks like that. I'm sorry to say it, but... He was so far outside whatever the norm of your common human experience is. And there he is. He wants a tour of the radio station. Next thing you know, Leatherface comes busting out of the record room. That part, uh, it still catches me off guard every time I see it. It does. <laughs> I love playing those scenes. Though. I love the physicality of the movie. I love that I was playing a character who was physically, emotionally, mentally, intellectually engaged all the time. And you absolutely were, and it, it reads so well on screen as a final girl type of movie. You are, in my mind, single-handedly one of the strongest. Day. You embody Jamie Lee Curtis' strength in the original Halloween when I in part two. It is, you are rooting for Jamie Lee Curtis, you are rooting for Stretch, you want nothing more than the best outcome for both of you. question I have left for you, Caroline. Do you think you could do a leather face shake for us? <laughs> Who's got a saw? <laughs> <laughs> Who's got a saw she can use? If there's Who no saw, Caroline who's got a saw? Borrow their saw. Here it comes! Here comes the saw! Saw his family! No, this is easy. This is easy. Okay. Start clapping. Give me some rhythm. We, Rob, give it, yeah. Clap, 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 clap. Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 with Caroline Williams doing the Leatherface Shake. Please give a warm, warm round of applause and a big thank you to Caroline Williams for joining us tonight. And give yourselves a round of applause for being here. Thank you guys so much for showing up. This is such a magical evening. Thank you so much. Officially on the records, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre never happened, but over and over again, reports of bizarre, grisly chainsaw mass murders have persisted all across the state of Texas. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre has not stopped. It haunts Texas. It seems to have no end.
my friend. We're here with my good buddy Mark Fletcher, who put on this amazing event tonight. With uh, with by the way, with David Cambrary and Brian Connery, he David wanted me to say my dog media. Exactly. I cannot not say my dog media. Very so, important. Yeah, that was, that's us. So how did you guys come up start? Who came up with this idea first? That sounds like a Mark Fletcher idea. Um, my goodness. Dave and I had a chat about this in 2019. We wanted to go back and do what we were doing at the Atlas Cinema in Illyria. We had originally screened The Evil Dead, the that original was, Texas Chainsaw. That was a midnight showing and Alan Sandweiss was you there? got it. Okay, I was, then, I was there for that. And then of course, The Toxic Avenger we did yes. that as well. So we wanted to come back and do this and we wanted to do it in a bigger venue on a bigger scale. And so here we are at the Lorraine Palace Theater, fast forward, two years and yes. here we are so obviously there was the C word that struck and it hit hard and heavy and it, it kind of disabled us and we weren't able to pursue what we wanted to pursue when we wanted to pursue it but here we are today tonight on the 16th of April 2022 and it's happening it's yes, here it and it's amazing so you, you made it happen that's, that's kind of the backstory behind that I love all the great vendors that you brought with you and yeah, and that was another labor of love. So that would be David's sister, Rachel, and her husband, Perry. I had them kind of go out and scour Lorraine County, Cuyahoga County, and, and everything in between to gather up as many like um, business cards and information that they could in regards to these vendors. So uh, that was kind of a labor of love, too. They, they, did the, they did the groundwork for me because I was bouncing around with the, with the park service and um, they got me the info so they probably threw me like 20 plus 30 plus cards and you know i went with like as many as i could so yeah. in the end we got 15 vendors to commit and here they are tonight perfect so, and you can feel free to talk to as many yeah interact with them that'd be great i They'd definitely will you hell yeah now how where how did the organ come up like did you already know someone who played the organ or did you put out like an ad say looking for an organ player for the <laughs> so that was the biggest that's 50% of what we're doing tonight. So Waxwork Records released the score to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part Two for the first time ever on vinyl as of last month. And I was, I was, you know, kind of reaching out to them to find out when it was going to arrive, when it would be, when it would be released. And I wanted it to coincide with the event that we're having tonight. So I reached out to composer Jerry Lampert and told him what we were doing and why we were doing it. And he was totally, he was stoked. And I asked him if we had any um, access to sheet music for an organist to perform this thing, which he did not have. Mm. So our organist, Saul Rosado, actually learned this material by ear, wow. which we, you know, you learn by ear, my yeah. friend. That's how you play your instrument. And that's how she plays her instrument. But it's a, but the organ is very finicky. The world of organ is very finicky. And so what, Saul did here tonight, and what you're going to hear here, and hopefully film in the near future, yes. um, is incredible. Wow. It's a big deal. So we got Jerry on board, but I mean, it was a labor of love again, because Jerry Lampert had no idea that the, the score even existed anymore. Hmm. So Waxwork Records had to connect with MGM Studios, who in turn connected with Waxwork Records. I mean, it was just a collaboration. So the composer... The, the studio and then the, the company that wanted to release the record all collaborated to get this record out and available to the public. So it's out there now, it's on, it's on all the major platforms, but streaming, but it's all also available on vinyl and it's also available on CD, which, you remember those? Contact this? Uh, briefly. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, that's a big deal. That's a big, this is actually the biggest deal for me believe it or not, is this performance tonight on the World Tour and the score being available. Now, Caroline Williams was just the icing on the cake. I was just going to ask She's that. She's absolutely incredible. In fact, we, I just met her intimately for the first time tonight, and she she's awesome. So friendly, free-spirited, easygoing, and just accommodating. Probably one of the most accommodating people I've ever met. So, well, outside of yourself. And a great actress. Yeah, a great actress. Chad Dennis is very accommodating. <laughs> Eddie Lloyd over here is very accommodating. But um, the bottom line is, uh, she's very accommodating, so we couldn't be more thankful. Yes. You definitely answered all my questions. I appreciate it, and thanks for putting this on for us. Thanks for being here. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Yep.
All right, everybody, get ready to give a big welcome to Sol Rosado on the organ. He's going to be playing here very shortly. Please be sure to welcome them. They're extremely talented to play the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 theme.
So where to even begin with you, Caroline? I don't even know. Because we have the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and that is such... It's, it's such a different film from the original, but it is such a beloved film because of its originality, because of how different it is, and I wondered if I could just take you back a little bit and ask you about your beginnings in Texas. Sure. Um, you know, Texas is a small marketplace, um, you know, event modeling and, and commercials and industrial films and things like that. And, and um, I was just curious to see if I could pull it off. I had worked with a small production company and um, had met lots of filmmakers coming in and out of town. And Urban Cowboy came to town and that really turned everything upside down. Terms of endearment, once again, it was really revolutionary in the Texas film market. Um, and it provided a wealth of opportunity for me. And I read for my very first movie for a French director named Louis Baume. Oh, wow. And how old were you? I was in maybe my mid-twenties. This would have been 1984, no, 1983. And the film starred Ed Harris and Amy Madigan and was shooting in Corpus Christi. And I went and read uh, for Mr. Mall, and I was hired nearly immediately, which was very surprising because it was, you know, it was a big studio picture, and you know, it was kind of a big deal. And I was terrified, but I, you know, the result was wonderful. It was a wonderful film, he, and he was—he's a legendary filmmaker. Um, Pretty Baby, Atlantic City, Revoir des Enfants, um, and just the guy was visionary. Uh, as Toby was, he says they took on daring subject matter that nobody else was taking on. For sure. At what point did you hear about the casting for Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2? So your first film was in, you said 1983, so that would have been three years before yes. part two. Uh, how did you learn about the casting call for Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2? It popped up in the local newspaper. It was just an ad in the paper? It wasn't even an ad, it was like a gossip column item. Oh, so it was a blurb. Like a <laughs> blurb was like, Toby Hooper, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and in parentheses, it's got like an exclamation point, and uh, is coming to Houston, do some, he's coming to Texas to do some, some casting on his sequel, 13 years later, he'll be shooting in the Austin area. And, you know, I had a little agent at the time who called him up and said, I'd really love to read for this. And I got to go audition. Now, something I have read about your audition is that it was very uh, memorable. <laughs> Can you tell the audience a little bit about what you went through uh, during your audition and how you stood out from the rest? Um, I was very aware of the fact that the pages we had, um, they only said, they had the physical action of her running down the hallway and she's screaming and she goes busting into the ice house and, and they live on fear, they live on fear. That's all that was given to us to read. And there was a long hallway uh, in Austin at the buildings that they were using for their production buildings. And they had auditioned more than 400 women and you know, Toby said that he wanted a, a Texas girl um, so anyway, you know, the girls went in, the girls went out, the girls went in, the girls went out. It was very quiet. And for a movie that has screaming and terror and horror and running and things like that, I just thought, you know, I'm just going to play it as it appears on the page. I'm going to do literally what it says on the page. And I ran down the hallway and I was screaming my head off and I flinged open the door and I went in and I pulled the chairs out from under Toby and Kitten and piled them in front of the door. And did they live on fear? They live on fear. And that's how I got hired. Wonderful. Is there a tape of that that exists? There has to be. <laughs> there has so to be. I would love to see that. Because on the one hand, back in, the, back in those days, <laughs> in the old days, um, there was not a lot of taped auditions. Everything was live. And if you were, no matter what you were reading for, you went live. And, um, and this was no exception. So whether, and of course there were no cell phones, 
none of the things that we're currently enjoying that are so technologically efficient um, were a part of the deal. So, yeah. Well, something that always stuck with me when I would read about Toby Hooper and his inspiration for the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I loved that he he got the idea um, partly when he was in a, a Montgomery Ward store, and it was around Christmas time, and it was very crowded, and he was extremely frustrated with how many people were there and pushing and shoving, and he saw a chainsaw for sale, and he just thought, like, this would solve all of my problems right now, and that's what gave him the idea to uh, pair Leatherface with the chainsaw, and when I read that LM Kit Carson um, was trying to figure out what kind of the group of people that Leatherface was going to target in the second one, the first one was obviously a van full of hippies, and the second one, uh, LM Kit Carson went to the mall and he was looking around and found himself surrounded by yuppies. So that's what he decided to put in in the opening scene. Two yuppies driving down the road, exactly. shooting. <laughs> and I just, I, I always thought that that was such a, an interesting segue to just move on to, you know, hippies, yuppies. Did anyone, did you ever get any, uh, not flashback, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you ever get any pullback from having that kind of an opening with... You know, it wasn't so... The, the politics of the time weren't so much about, like, the yuppies and stuff, because the yuppies, you know, this was, I think, uh, the Reagan era. And so everybody was ambitious, and everybody wanted to make money, and Texas was booming, and every place seemed to be booming, and people were way into that shit. Um, the politics came in when Toby shot the scene of the saw between my legs. Really? And feminists were outraged. They're always outraged, okay, I get it. But I'm a Dolly Parton feminist, so it's a little different. <laughs> it's like diet feminism. <laughs> it's, it's like fe feminism with a chainsaw. Um, that was the thing that really got people going. I mean, Playboy magazine wanted to put me in the magazine. People at universities were once again re-exploring the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and its cruelty to women, and that you know, and, and that whole thing. But the women in the Chainsaw films are from Texas, and though those women aren't going to put up with a lot of shit for too long. That's exactly what I noticed about your character Stretch. Yeah. You play her with such a, a steadfast strength and earnestness. She is so likable. You're rooting for her for, from the first scene. And honestly, for me, men, stay with me here. When I watch part two, to me, it seems like a, a, it is like a woman's movie. You are the movie. You, you, you uh, the, the scene when you first run into Chop Top, and it's about finding yourself in these uncomfortable scenarios that you have to, you have to play to the man who's in front of you while getting out of a very sticky situation. And I think every female has absolutely been in that situation. I mean, not obviously with Chop Top. Um, <laughs> I mean, but you know. <laughs> men who feel like that, and there are so, there's a lot of points of reference that I, I, it always resonates with me every time I, I watch it, even when the first time I saw it in high school, that it just felt like I had been her before. And I think that's what women embraced her so much as a character, because she was motivated, obviously, to take the initiative in her own defense and to try to turn the tables on this crazy family, because they're crazy. And, you know, she's trapped in their underground lair. She's underground. You know, Chop Top, when we shot that scene, I had not seen Bill in his makeup yet. I, he was doing four-hour makeups every morning, and then at least a couple hours in, when we would wrap to get the makeup off. So I never really saw Bill until he came to set. And just everything about it, there's a visceral body reaction to somebody who looks like that. I'm sorry to say it, but he was so far outside whatever the norm of your common human experience is, and there he is, he wants a tour of the radio station. I mean, 
Are you fucking crazy? <laughs> and and you're you're being the, the polite female. You go, okay, okay, yeah, that's uh, how am I gonna get out of this? But I have to be nice to <laughs> make sure that I escape unscathed. And the next thing you know, Leatherface comes busting out of the record room. That part, uh, it still catches me off guard every time I see it. It does. <laughs> I love playing those scenes. Though. I love the physicality of the movie. I love that I was playing a character who was physically, emotionally, mentally, intellectually engaged all the time. And you absolutely were. It, it reads so well on screen as a final girl type of movie. You are, in my mind, single-handedly one of the strongest. That you embody Jamie Lee Curtis' strength in the original Halloween when I in part two. It is, you are rooting for Jamie Lee Curtis, you are rooting for Stretch, you want nothing more than the best outcome for both of you, and neither of you are whiny. You're just like, well, this is what this is what has been dealt to me, and we're this going to, do. the only way out is through. And yeah. <laughs> for me, what really stood out in my mind, two things. In talking to Kit Carson, he said you have big shoes to fill. Marilyn Burns. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, Marilyn Burns in the first one, my God, that was astounding to me, watching that movie for the first time. You know, Pam was whiny, she ended up on the hook. Marilyn had to put up with all the whiny, and she finally comes out in the lead at the end, right? Um, the other thing Kit said to me is he said, always keep in the back of your mind, there is a there's a very primitive viciousness uh, in women. Women have a very real ferocity. And they're always hiding it because you're not supposed to do it because you're nice and you know. And so that was that was invaluable to me. Primitive ferociousness. I I love that. that and that's absolutely true. While we're on the subject of strength and your character, were there any stunts that you did yourself? I can't, Beth Nauman was my stunt double. Okay. Physically, we were virtual replicas of each other. We used to stand in the makeup room and our bruises all matched, you know? Um, the thing about stunting is the stunt people usually do longer, the long shots and they keep their faces kind of hidden or kind of out of the way. And then as the actor, you come in and you do what they call sort of the inserts, the close-ups. So you have to replicate the physical action, but your face is right in front in camera. And that's how people think it's you. So I, all kudos to Beth Nauman. I mean, it's like being a ballet dancer. You can't, you can't copy that shit. <laughs> But I did do my best, and I was in shape, and I was ready for the challenge. The best stunt was when I go tumbling down the rabbit hole. Because I had to somersault down this long, like it was an intestine, and it had like roots coming out of it. It was filled with dirt, getting dirt everywhere, but it was built onto a slide. A okay. slide. So it's sharply canted down to like 45 degrees. And I had to, I had to somersault down that thing over and over. And each time I completed a round, <laughs> which was the last thing I wanted to do. But, um, you know, just great fun stunts. And the stuff I got to do with Bill Mosley, um, I haven't gotten to do stuff like that since, really. Were there any injuries you sustained? Oh my God, we were always banging ourselves up. Thank God, the biggest injury I suffered, I was in mid-screen, up by the clock. Oh my. <laughs> That's why you died. It's after nine o'clock. It's after nine o'clock. Little kids in the it's a very difficult jacket to wear, but it looks really good. Um, um, the worst injury, I'm cuddled up by the clock in the, in the ice house. I've already done, we've already done the scene with the saw in the ice tub. And I'm trying to escape from him. And I'm in mid-screen 
and it cut right out. No screen. No screen. No talking. No screaming. Nothing came out of my mouth. And we, I mean, we all just kind of, what am I going to do now? You know? So we had to come to a determination. I went ahead and shot second unit in various stunts and movement and things. It didn't, it didn't hurt, it didn't pain me. But um, evidently I had ruptured something in my um, trachea or something, I don't know. Um, and they took me to the emergency room and the doctor looked at me and he said, I'm gonna give you these steroids, you're gonna take these and you'll be fine. But just alternate screaming days and talking days. So there would be screaming days and there would be talking days. And, you know, we managed. We managed it. How, how long before your voice, like, did it ever fully come back between it, alternating? I mean, yeah. it came back now, but it I mean, did. during yeah. the production. It did. I have a very, I have a lazy voice. I talk out of the top of my larynx and the top of my the apparatus. Instead of coming from, you know, you're supposed to come from your diaphragm and all that stuff, which is like exercising. I mean, it feels like you're doing ab work. I'm not going to do it. Anyway, um, but yeah, we, we, we pulled it off. We made it work. And so, uh, Canon was the uh, production company who put out Texas Chainsaw 2. Oh, from what I understand, you started with a budget of 5.6 million, and then during both pre-production and production, they cut the budget by nearly a million, or was it? It was over, over a little over a million. Here's the deal on that. I was going to say, I hope you exa <laughs> you have all the excitement. Had a deal with Canon that that involved a number of films, a set number of films, and they had budgeting available for all those films. The invaders from Mars went way over. So to compensate inexplicably, uh, Canon, I think, wanted to take a little from our pie to feed the invaders. And Toby was in the middle of editing Invaders from Mars at the same time we were shooting Chainsaw. He was getting by on just a few hours of sleep every day. But it was a really bad deal for him. It didn't give him the luxury of developing the projects as fully and as creatively and as, as you know, in as good a way as he wanted to do them. Um, it was just, it was very, very troublesome. Canon was a very troublesome operation, but boy, they made a lot of money. And did that affect your shooting schedule, having... Nothing affected mine, because I, I was on camera virtually every hour of every day. I'm in nearly every single frame of the film. Um, I'm on camera more than any other character. So, you know, we just kept working. I can't, you know, I can't think about that shit. I gotta think about my lines and relating to the characters and all the various people and stuff. Um, it was horrible for Toby. I can't imagine. And but I, I, as you said, you were in every single, I mean, to me, you are the movie. You you are Texas Chainsaw Park. I don't know, I had really great co-stars. I mean, Bill Mosley, Bill Johnson. Jim Sidow, that crazy goofy family. I mean, it's that, that, uh, yeah, there was always a temptation, especially with Bill, and you'll see it. And Dennis Hopper, who could forget Dennis? Um, the temptation to just watch them and just watch them and just kind of marvel at them. I mean, Dennis, especially, um, but also. Bill Mosley as Chop Top. That character was so unusual and so different, and to this day, it is still high, a highly individual character in movies. Being that you are such a big part of the movie, when you saw the film poster, which replicates the Breakfast Club pose, and you're missing, how, okay. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine how I was so fun. mad at Toby because when they went to go shoot the poster, Toby was all happy. It's a Breakfast Club poster, blah, blah. I thought, oh, great. I'll be Ali Sheedy. I'll, <laughs> I'll be one of the Breakfast Club. They went to go shoot it and they left me out of it. That must have been heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking because, I mean, that is such a big part of PR and marketing to be on the poster in the lobby. It's a, it's, it, it's a deal. But what Toby said to me is, look, we're trying to emphasize the family. 
you know, we're, so we're doing that, we're emphasizing the family, but you carry the film. I mean, you know, I, listen, I love Toby. He was very eccentric and would sometimes make inexplicable decisions. <laughs> Artists. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm okay with <laughs> it. Um, yeah, I mean, you were you were the only woman truly in the movie besides the chili cook-off woman. <laughs> I, I am the only woman in the film. But I was comfortable. I've lived my whole life among really interesting, cool men. And, but I, you know, nothing bad has happened to me. And I value the men who have been in my life and are in my life. And, so, you know, being with that company of players and the stunt team, you know, Beth, my stunt double, was one of the only other women uh, on the thing. And uh, I was comfortable with all the guys. I was comfortable with Tom Savini. You know, these are macho guys. These are like really mega macho guys. But they were just, they were fun and engaging and smart and funny. And who doesn't want that? Since you brought him up, Tom Savini, I am a diehard Savini fan. Um, if I ever were to get another tattoo, it might be Tom Savini at the small of my back. You, I don't should, know. <laughs> you should do that. You should put um, a sex machine on the small of your back. <laughs> Men will go, oh, fuck, I'm out of here. Sorry. <laughs> Can we maybe cover Tom? Can we cover his mighty gun? What I loved about him is uh, he was what made me able to watch scary movies because what helped me getting over them as a child was learning the special effects. And when I got to see behind that curtain, he had a film he put out with Fangoria, a documentary called Scream Greats, and that was in the 80s and it showed all of his uh, techniques. Do you have any memorable times with Tom on set that you could share? Because I love the film still with you and Tom and Nubbins. Uh, hanging out on set. Did he do, I mean, he really didn't, aside from putting the face on, did he have to do many makeup applications on you? Not many at all. We had blood applications. I think I had a wound on my leg at one point to film mostly because, I mean, four hours, they had to put the ball cap on the shade as hell, the, the plate, the colors. I mean, it was just, it was so extraordinary and so extensive. Um, all I knew is he was a brilliant artist, and as soon as I was hired and they moved me to Austin, one of the first places I went was Tom's Ghoul School. You know, he, he had his factory creating all the special effects, body parts, all the stuff you see in the smokehouse. Um, gallons and blood and blood and blood and blood. Um, he had this creepy book. And I know it's still in existence. It was the Encyclopedia of Forensic Science or something. <laughs> Big ass book. And you open it up and it shows all the horrible ways that people can die. Hanging, burning, stabbing, auto accident, murder, all kinds of murder, head cut off, limbs cut off, I mean, I have never seen stuff like this. And I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Well, you were the only uh, woman in the film to share a hotel room with Dennis Hopper. What was it? Well, not a hotel room. <laughs> we were across the hall from each other. I mean, the scene when we, you go to his... Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes hotel room. No, I wasn't trying to insinuate you oh, share your, your cast. It's hotel. not like I didn't try. <laughs> really? Yeah. I, I, I know, I know. This is an okay story to tell. God rest his soul. The guy was a genius. He was a superstar. He, he had an extraordinary career. And he came of age during a time where having women was just ordinary. It's a candy store. All the women want you. The women pursue you. You don't have to pursue the women. The women pursue you. So... He invited me to his room uh, at the condo complex where we were all staying. He had the most exquisite, completely reversible, don't ask me how I know, but I'll tell you. Completely reversible Italian-made silk robe. This thing was a work of art, it's So he invites me over, we're going to talk about stuff. 
And that robe is just flapping all over the place, that robe. And as I've told people, Dennis may have been a short man, but he was not a small man. <laughs> and one night, we went to dinner, and I told him, I just said, oh, Dennis. And he closed the robe, and we had this magnificent conversation. The man knew everybody. The man represented American culture from the late 40s through the 60s, and he was seminal as a filmmaker. So respect must be paid, right? He invites me to dinner. We go out. We're sitting across from each other at the table. He starts futzing around with his dishes and things, and he goes, so Carolyn, how do you feel about recreational sex? <laughs> Valid question. I start futzing around with all my stuff, and I go, well, Dennis, with you, I don't think about it at all. <laughs> and he said, good, we got that out of the way. And we went ahead and ate oysters, and I took him to see Kirk Whalen, this extraordinary saxophone player on 6th Street. I said, you're going to love the saxophone player, player Kirk Whalen. He's from the 8th, but the 6th floor, 5th floor down in Houston. He is amazing. You know, Caroline, I know Miles Davis. You know, I know some of the greatest musicians that have ever lived. The next day, he shows up on set and says, you know what, I took Caroline to see this incredible saxophone player I know named Kirk Whalen. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. They just, you know, they were kings back then. Guys like that were kings. You know, Clark Gable and Rock Hudson, okay, may have been gay, but hey, he, the guy got action. Um, James Dean, I mean, you know, they all, they got tons of women, and the women wanted to be gotten. I mean, I hate to put it that way. I, I understand me too. I totally get it, you know. But that's that's the way they handle things, and so I handled everything right back. The relationship between Stretch and Lefty is such a unique one that you get to watch play out as the movie goes on, and the way you say, the way you let out Lefty when you're getting hit in the back, of, it's just, it's gut-wrenching. And uh, Mark, actually, of My Dog Media, wanted me to specifically ask you this question that, in the original script, was there a plotline where Stretch may or may not have wound up being Lefty's illegitimate daughter? I am so glad you asked that question because I have the final draft shooting script dated June 28th. We wrapped on July 4th. So every single character, every single scene, every single thing that ever went into that script, I have on my table. When, she, when Stretch is making her entrance into the chili cook-off, she's saying, mumbling to herself, she's saying under her breath, Mama always said he was full of pride, he's slumbering in his pride. Because she's saying that her mother had a relationship or knew Lefty and Ryan. And when I read that, I said, is Lefty her father? And Kit was going to pipe up and say, well, actually, that's the way I wrote it. Uh, Toby said, oh, no, that's, we're not playing that. We're not doing that. I believe Lefty was her father. I believe Lefty was her father. And by serendipity, they ended up getting together. And the idea was they were going to solve this together. You've got that scene with him in the hotel room. He goes on to have a mezcal um, hallucination in a closet that you don't get to see. Um, but yeah, I, I do believe very, very much um, that I, I do believe that that's true. I do believe that's the foundation of that character. Because you do feel a fondness there. You both played that towards each other as the I movie agree. went on. I agree. And circling back to the things that were cut from the movie, I know that Joe Bob Briggs had a cameo in the film. Were you on set when he was filming that? Because I, I only have seen like very small snippets of it from a little featurette that was a news item. Not YouTube, but right. I, yeah, so. I have the biggest crush on him. <laughs> 
He's so tall. <laughs> he's lovely. He's so, he's so handsome. He's a brilliant writer, as John Bloom. He was one of the primary editors, writers, contributors to the Dallas Morning Herald, Texas Monthly, um, uh, The Atlantic. I mean, the guy is revered as a scholar, and he wrote an amazing book in 1985 called Evidence of Love that is now being turned into a TV movie for HBO, miniseries, starring Jessica Biel. So, and it's about a famous axe murder that took place in Texas. And I, I, I crushed on him like that. I so wanted to meet him. I had the book. I wanted to get my book signed. And here I am, 2022. John and I talk once in a while. Yeah. Email back and forth. When are you going to sign my goddamn book? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, those scenes were cut. They weren't. They weren't shot particularly well. And part of that was just the budget crunch and the time crunch, because Canon put us on a time crunch. We shot the last two weeks of the film, 14 days in a row, and we were shooting almost 20 hours a day. And, and A and B the last 14 days that you were shooting, what scenes were you shooting? Were you at Texas Battlelands? Were there was so, I can't even remember. I, I remember sleeping in my trailer on site, didn't, did not go back to the hotel room. You just had to kind of clean up the clothes as best you could. We all smelled so bad. Um, I mean, Bill Mosley was sleeping in the makeup chair. Uh, Bill Johnson. I mean, it was it was very very difficult, and we just went balls out for the last two weeks. Since you mentioned clothes, a crucial part to me of stretch is her wardrobe. Yes. You start out with uh, everything. Well, everything is bedazzled. You've got the ZZ Top shirt that's bedazzled, and then. God, I wish I still had. I, that, that was going to be my first question. Where, where's the ZZ Top shirt? Um, my sister washed her car with it. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I wasn't thinking. <laughs> and, and then you have the, sh the shirt with the bedazzled collar and obviously the iconic shorts. Do you still have the shorts? We were all given our wardrobe by Toby's wife, Karen, who was the wardrobe designer, did all the costumes. I took mine home, I left it somewhere, I don't know what happened. My little sister occasionally would ask me, can I wear this? And you know, there it goes, gone. I had nothing left of the original wardrobe at all. Because I love that aqua, the, the dome bubble watch, I always wanted one of those when I was oh, kid, never got it. Oh, so I have such a nice group. <laughs> a young woman showed up at a con, and she had the entire outfit from boots to shorts, the very belt. She had gotten all the little bedazzles on that collar, precisely the ones that were on there, and she had them arranged the way they were supposed to be arranged. The bubble watch, the necklace, the little dangling heart pearl earrings, the little t-shirt, the, the white beater that goes underneath, she put a little dot, little dots, you know, like she's George Seurat, you know, picnic in the park with George. She replicated the whole thing, and she said, I want to give this to you. I said, you're not giving it to me, I'm paying you for it. And I paid her very generously, because she, it took her months to make that goddamn thing. She got the sunglasses. That's incredible. I have a replica, a, a nearly perfect replica of the whole costume. There are no, I'm convinced that there are no better fans in any fandom than horror movie fans. I see that time and again at every convention that I go to. I mean, that, that's just how that's how it is. I mean, if, when you look at mainstream movies, you know, Maybe Chris Pratt would go to a convention. I mean, they go to Comic Con, they make appearances, and they do stuff like that. But to actually have a personal and up close relationship with your fans, where you're talking to them, where they tell you what they liked, what they didn't like, what they want more of, what they want less of. You know, there's a reason that there's this new wave of, 80s, of, of, of 1980s inspired horror, because the fans insisted on it. 
And if there's any filmmaker that isn't paying attention and listening to that, it's also creating a resurgence in the art of the modeling, puppetry, prosthetics, color, paint, everything that Tom Savini and Greg Nicotero and Rob Bottin and all these amazing guys um, made with their own hands, you know? And um, that's the reason there's such a huge difference between horror fans and all the other fans. I think I read that um, there is something to be said for physical special effects. The human eye can detect when something is CGI, and while it may still look good, you're not experiencing it and receiving it the same way as a physical analog effect. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, circling back to Texas Battlelands Amusement Park, what was that experience like filming there? Because it had been abandoned, if I'm not mistaken, correct? And yeah. that's, did you build the tunnel scene? Did they build the tunnel scene for that? Was that on that set or was that a separate, walk me through. <laughs> yeah, Battleland had basically fallen into disrepair. All of the rides had been um, taken apart. They still had some track from like one of the little kid you know, roller coasters. Um, they still had some interiors, they still had some of the figures. They went up the through and they just mocked it back up. They just kind of restored it to make it look really amazing. And um, everything else that you see was built inside of the Austin American Statement, State, Statesman newspaper press room, which is easily as high as this. Uh, it's three stories, and I don't know how we measure stories, but easily as high or higher than this. And Carrie White, who was our art director, who was, it still is so extraordinary, he went into the interior of this place, he hung a lot of stuff in it, and then he sprayed gun all over it. And went through, and he meticulously decorated every single corner of that space. He created the dioramas, he created the tunnel that I run through, he created the place where we go scampering over the bridge, he created Chainsaw Heaven, he created um, everything is in there. Um, now at that land, all those big ribs that they had, those ribs were there and they were intact and it was such a great effect for camera. Obviously we we're going to use that. <coughs> But falling down underground and the other side, that was also uh, built in that giant, extraordinary space. What's, what's so striking about the film is definitely how stark of a contrast it is to the first, down to the lighting. The lighting is so specific and it, it very much invokes Dario Argento, you know, kind of a Suspiria feel. And I guess I don't know where I'm going with that. That was more of a statement than a question. <laughs> well, but it's also, it's kind of grainy. A lot of the lighting for me in Suspiria, it's, it's very flat. Mm -hmm. Because that really makes the blues and purples and reds pop. And he, to me, Argento, in that film specifically, he was very geometric in his art direction and the way he styled and composed his shots. You got lots of angles and, and uh, uh, things are not necessarily curvy or round. They're very angular, you know. Um, in, in our film, it was all shot on Super 16, and it had that really kind of gritty, gritty look to it, you know. It worked amazingly, and it, I guess my question is when the, films, the film was finally released, its reception, how did you find yourself navigating that from the critics to the fans? Um, we got trashed. Um, we were released without a rating. Not even an NC step. I don't, there wasn't even an NC step 17. There was nothing. Now, in that time period. Or an X. I mean, nothing. For a film to be released unrated, without a, without a rating, was that somewhat of a death sentence almost? Completely. Chains would not take it were not included in their, in their packages. It had to be purchased individually. 
usually by individual theaters. Um, I don't remember the first time that I saw Chainsaw 2 in a movie theater. I don't recall. I know when it was released. It was shown somewhere in Dallas, and I think I went and saw it with some friends. I had a tough time getting an agent. I went to LA, and the people I visited with said, you're over the top, it's a terrible film, nobody takes Toby seriously anymore, and so on and so forth. Um, so, the way that got resolved is, I had Dennis's phone number, and he had mine, and he had been very generous, introducing me to various people. He got me a membership at the hottest nightclub in town. Um, you know, he, it, we ran into each other somewhere. He said, how's it going? I said, I can't get an agent. The next day, he walked me through the door of his agency. And I got signed. That's the only reason it happened. It's all, it truly really is all about who you know. It's, it's about who you know. And I mean, people, we had just gotten Dennis fresh off of Blue Velvet. And, and, and David Lynch, who's revered. Never mind that David Lynch reveres Toby Hooper. That didn't matter to any of them. Um, Dennis had lost a lot of money. His alcoholism and drug addiction was extremely costly. He got married and divorced all the time. He had a ton of kids. Not a ton, but he had a lot of kids. Um, and he lost all his money. So he had to take what was offered. Looking back at your character stretch, K-O-K-L-A, you played a DJ. Did you have any experience in radio at all? Was that something that you ever practiced as a kid? I did that with a tape recorder. I pretended I was on the radio when I was, you know, 10. With no one listening. But, <laughs> but you, you were so, you were such a natural in the film. And my, Question is, did you ever get any radio roles after that or portray anyone? Um, Ten minutes of midnight, but. Strange, <laughs> um, I didn't have any radio experience. I'd done a ton of voiceovers. Oh, so I knew how to modulate my voice and, and be on the microphone and things like that. Um, you know, we used to listen to, to um, um, Hallamuff in Via Cunha, right across from Del Rio, Texas. And, you know, he had this uh, uh, amazing radio show and played all the top hits, and it was awesome, and I loved it. You know, we had transistor radios, Google, Google transistor radio. Um, that was it, just listening to other people, and, and uh, you know, I, I fell into it pretty easily. And then, of course, now I've, I've played Amy Marlowe in 10 Minutes to Midnight where I am once again a DJ with an entirely different um, story and outcome. So, I don't know, they're wonderful bookends, those movies. Absolutely. They really are. And you look amazing. You're so sweet. In, the, in 10 minutes. Oh my God. Just, you're lit beautifully, your, your outfits are beautiful, and it just... We had the most amazing DP, and he pulled off some tricks. I, I, I was amazing. The scene where I'm supposed to be playing much, much younger. I'm supposed to be playing the beginning of my radio career, not the end. So instead of being 50 years old, he's got me at 25. I would think we would all agree that there are no tricks needed to make her oh, look any younger. <laughs> no, but really, there are. <laughs> thank you. But no, Thompson Wen, Thompson Wen, uh, the guy had a great camera set up and he really knew how to light me. And instead of putting me in costumes or makeup or something that makes me seem silly young, he just lit me in such a way that I just had this incredible glow. And you get to see the character when she is beginning her career. And the guy, it's just, it's magic. It's magic. I, 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 it's one of my favorite scenes in the film. Well, I know that you just wrapped Redfield, and I wanted to ask you about what, I, I know that you're limited on as much information that you can give about that, but from what I understand, it's a Universal Monsters picture. It is a Universal picture, Chris McKay from the Tomorrow War is the director. He is a huge horror fan, which I did not know. Uh, you know, one of the many social media friendships that I have with various film professionals and fans and friends and you name it 
and um, this movie came up and he said, I would really love for you to audition for, you know, I can't offer you a starring role, but I can offer you a strong secondary. I ended up auditioning for five different parts and it took five months and I had to keep going back and retaping and retaping and retaping and then we had to have Zooms with the studio people. We had to have Zooms with the production people. Um, it went on a long time. Started, started reading for him in October. I finally got hired in February. The only question I have left for you, Caroline, do you think you could do a Leatherface shake for us? <laughs> Who's got a saw? Hmm. <laughs> Who's got a saw she can use? If there's Who's no left, saw, Caroline who's Williams? got a saw? Borrow their saw. Here it comes. Here comes the saw. Saw his family. No, this is easy. This is easy. Okay. Start clapping. Give me some rhythm. We proud. Give it. Yeah. Clap. 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 Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 with Caroline Williams doing the Leatherface Shake. Please give a warm, warm round of applause and a big thank you to Caroline Williams for joining us tonight. And give yourselves a round of applause for being here. Thank you guys so much for showing up. This is such a magical evening. Thank you so much.